and you've talked about confession, and you've talked a bit about surrender, and, and today we're going to talk about repentance. But when, when I think about this idea of deeper, I don't know about you, I think about life's most fundamental questions. You see, because there are some questions that you ask as Wiganers, like where are we going for pie, and where are we going, you know, all the, all the things, right? And then there are questions that we ask in Kansas City, and there are th questions that we ask in Africa and in China, but then there are some questions that we all ask. They are part of our humanity. They're part of the, the, the core of what it means to be human. It, questions like, who am I? We would call that the identity question. What, what am I known for? What am I good at? These are all identity questions that we all ask. And then questions like, what should I do with my life? Where should I go? Should I marry this person? Should I live over here? That's, that's what we call the mission question of life. Everybody asks themselves the identity question, and the mission question at some point in their life, and then usually they ask it over and over and over again through every season that you walk through. And there are a lot of great authors where you can read some great books, and in the West we call it self-actualization. It means becoming the best possible version of yourself by understanding who you are and what you're supposed to be doing. If you go into a bookstore, you're going to see one of the largest sections now is what they call the self-help section or the self-improvement section. You can sit down with great coaches and mentors who are going to try and help you figure out who you are and what you should be doing. And all those things are crucial. But I actually think that there's another fundamental question that, that should precede these two questions that we actually ask often after these two questions. And it's the legacy question, which is how will people remember me? How will people remember me? I want to take us down this journey for the next few minutes of how people will remember me. And I think you're going to see how this is core and fundamental to this subject of repentance. So when we talk about this, and I think it's a very human thing to do, to talk about who we are and how we want to be remembered. Like everybody wants to be remembered for something. I come back here 20 years later, 25 years from when I first moved here, and people still go, man, I, I remember you. And, and that feels good. Feels good, doesn't it? We all want our lives to count for something. We want to make sure that we made a mark. Everybody wants to feel, especially in youth culture, we want to feel like we were a world changer, like something mattered because we existed. That's core to who we are. And I think that's a good thing. When I, when I was in primary school, my teacher came in with a shoebox one day, and she said, we're going to make a time capsule. I don't know if you know what a time capsule is. I didn't know what a time capsule is. But she said, we're going to take lots of things from around the classroom. You can bring things from home. We're going to put it in the shoebox. We're going to bury it in the back of the school until the, like, the magical futuristic Jetsons year of 2015. And she said, in 30 years' time, they're going to reopen this box, and they're going to see what life was like in 1985. Now, 1985 is the year that Nintendo was built, and none of us were rich enough to own a Nintendo. So we br all brought in our Atari games instead. And then we had coins from 1985 and books from 1985. Then the school shut down in 2011, so I don't think the, the box was ever open. Some digger pulled it up, right? That, that's how things go. But we did that because we wanted to feel like we were passing something on to the next generation. Having a multi-generational view. When you have kids, you start thinking multi-generationally. You start thinking about the impact that you're gonna make. And the good news for us is the Bible has a lot to say about multi-generational thinking. You open up the Psalms and Psalm 79, 13 says, then we, your people, then we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, excuse me, I want to make sure I don't go over. We, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will praise you forever from generation to generation. We will proclaim your praise. Psalm 145, 4 says, one generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. And you can go on and on and on through scripture, and you'll see this concept of generations. You know, our God actually defines himself as the God of multi-generational. God defines himself a lot of different ways. He calls himself, I am. Then he calls himself the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Sometimes he's your provider. Sometimes he's your protector. But God also describes himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Multi-generational God. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not the God of just Abraham, though he describes himself that way sometimes. But Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Multi-generational thinking. 
Then when you open up your Bible and you start reading, you get to some really boring bits in the Bible. Like you, you get to something called genealogies. Anybody read a genealogy in the Bible? And it just goes, so-and-so begot so-and-so who begot so-and-so who begot so You can hardly pronounce the names and you wonder why it's there. Genesis chapter 5 gives us the genealogy of Cain and Abel. Genesis chapter 10 gives us the genealogy of Noah's sons. Then you go ahead and there are eight chapters in 1 Chronicles of genealogies, the genealogy of Israel. Then you get to the first 17 verses of Matthew. How does Matthew want to tell you about Jesus' life? He starts with the genealogy. Luke 3, a little bit more of Jesus' genealogy. He's laying it all out for us and giving us genealogy after genealogy, and you kind of wonder, why is it there? Now, there's a few reasons, right? Number one, it's a historical book. So this helps us understand we're reading a historical book. It also gives us a picture of prophecies. How do prophecies work? It also gives us this context of a larger story that we're a part of. All of these things are true. But, but on top of that, there were really practical reasons why genealogies mattered and they needed to write it down. For instance, this is what Michael Wilkins, professor emeritus at Biola says. Stick with me, even though he's a college professor. He says, God's people kept extensive genealogies, which served as a record of a family's descendants, but were also used for practical and legal purposes to establish a person's heritage, inheritance, legitimacy, and rights. Knowledge of one's descendant was especially necessary if a dispute occurred to ensure that property went to the right person. In other words, what he's saying is, this is for practical reasons. No one kept records. There was no office where the deeds of land come. Now, if you're living in the ancient world, then you're a farmer. You're either farming sheep and cattle or you're farming crops. But what does a farmer need? Land. A farmer needs land. And how, how do you know what land is yours? Through your genealogy. You're able to go back in time 10 generations ago, well, this land is mine because of who my father was and his grandfather and, and so on and so forth. It's mine. It's settled land disputes. But beyond the practical reasons, the other reason why genealogies are so important is because of the spiritual side, the blessings and the curses that were produced in family lines. The blessing of Abraham, the blessing of Isaac, the blessing of Jacob, bestowed to people for multiple generations. But then the curses, the curses came when people turned their backs on God as well. And this is so important. We love to talk about blessing. We don't like to talk about curses. Everybody loves the idea that maybe their grandparents passed down a spiritual blessing to them. Nobody wants to think that their grandparents passed down a spiritual curse to them. But I want us to understand that the Bible doesn't just talk about blessing, it talks about curses as well. And the most crucial, perhaps the most well-known of all of the curses is found in Exodus chapter 20 in the Ten Commandments. It says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. And i got to be honest with you. Most people in our modern culture look at that and think that's wildly unfair. Why should I have to pay for the sins of something that happened 100 years ago? And you wouldn't be wrong. In fact, the Bible has other things to say about this. If you go through in Deuteronomy 24, it also says, parents are not to be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their parents. Each will die for their own sin. And Ezekiel 18.20 says, the one who sins is the one who will die the child will not share the guilt of the parent, nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. So we know that there is a separation of generations, that you will pay the price for your own sin. That that is a price that has to be paid by somebody. You will pay the price for your sin, not just for your parents. So then why does Exodus 20 tell us the third and fourth generation? I think it's locked in there around this idea that says the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. And here's why I brought you through this really interesting or maybe boring exegesis on genealogies. Because something always gets passed down. Something always gets passed down. Now, why is this important to the fundamental questions of your life? Why is this more important than who am I and what should I be doing with my life? Because don't you see, 
what you do, who you are, is all tied to where you came from. You and I have been formed by somebody or by a group of people before we ever walked into this room. Every one of us has been given some advantage in life and some disadvantage in life. Every one of us. And so if you want to know who you are and what you should be doing, you need to go back and go, what was passed down to me? What was given to me without me even realizing it in my DNA? You know, I walk into one of my friend's houses, and on the wall, he's got something called a family tree. And it shows, you know, grandma and grandpa and mom and dad and all the kids and all the grandkids and so on and so forth. And I see that, and a lot of people see that. But do you know what? When you look at your family tree, it is possible that what you don't see are the names on the wall, but what you see is a, a family tree littered with addiction. You see on your wall a family tree littered with divorce and broken relationship. You see in your family tree angry people. You see in your family tree anxious and fearful people. And as you look at that family tree, it can become overwhelming on the inside. And I don't know if you've ever thought it before. You know, I'm, I'm really grateful for my parents. I had good parents. But I also recognize that there's some good things they passed down. And there's some not so good things that they passed down that they didn't even know they were passing down. I don't blame them for that because they also came from somewhere else. But don't you understand that, that there's, there's all these separate layers. In psychology, they refer to this as a genogram, not just a family tree, but a genogram. And they start looking and they say, you have broken relationships in your past. You've got fear and anxiety. You've got addiction in your past. Don't you see? And it could cause us to feel stuck it can cause us to feel like we're never going to break out of it. We look at, some of us look at our family tree, and you know what we're thinking? We're thinking everyone in my family tree is poor. And I'm never going to not be poor because that is who we are. And when you get stuck on the inside, you begin to think to yourself just for a moment, God, is this what it is? You know, I love what Pete Scazzaro says about this concept of genograms. He says, Jesus may be in your heart, but grandpa is in your bones. And it's this whole idea, right, that you can't escape your DNA. Like your core DNA is there. It's in you. So how on earth do we become the best possible version of our life? How do we become all that God wants us to be? How do we do all that God wants us to do? How do we break free from some of these gravitational pulls that bring us back into places we don't want to go and into people we don't want to be? How do we leave the sort of legacy that we want to lead? This is what I've learned. As I open up the pages of scripture and as God has taught me, it is abundantly clear I cannot do this on my own. When I open up the pages of scripture, I realize there is a nature. It's not coming from my parents or my grandparents, but it goes all the way back. Romans 8, 5 says, those who are dominated by the sinful nature. It is in your nature to sin. Brokenness is in your nature. It's in your nature and in your family's nature. Don't you see that as much as you want to break out of it, it's your native language to want to sin against God, to want to be in a broken state. It says dominated by sinful nature and sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please God. In other words, there's a transformation for some that takes place into a new identity, and that seems to only happen with God. And so I say it this way. I say the Bible teaches that if you want to break curses, if you want to become the real you, if you want to know what you should do, you've got to learn to surrender and repent. Here's the difference between surrender and repentance. It's real easy. Surrender means to stop. We've all seen those cop movies where they go, stick them up, and you do this. I surrender. That means to stop. Repentance means to turn. One means to stop. The other means to turn. The, the Greek word that Jesus would have used is metanoia. And metanoia just means to have a change of mind or a change of heart. So when, when I say I change my mind, right, that is repentance. That's 
changing in a different direction. When I say, I've had a change of heart about a situation. That's repentance. That's turning. That's metanoia. Turning in a different direction. And what Jesus is saying is, in context of the scriptures, he's saying, when you repent of your sin, when you have a change of mind around your nature, and you start moving in a new direction, that's when you're going to experience freedom and joy. And that's why we say, do you understand this? Is this helpful? That's why we say that the road to freedom and deliverance is through repentance. You want to experience freedom and deliverance, it's through repentance. Curses are real, my friends. And it begins when we confront them through repentance. Galatians 3 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. The curse of the law, the curse of not being good enough. By becoming a curse for us, taking the weight of our sin on the cross, and it says, cursed is everyone who's hung on a pole. Why did he do it? He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham, no longer cursed but blessed, might be given to the Gentiles, all of us non-Jews in the room, through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. In other words, he broke the curse by becoming the curse that we might experience the blessing of God. That's pretty good news. You don't have to be perfect. I don't know if you've been told this week you're not good enough, but most of us have. Get out of the way. You didn't move fast enough. Uh, you know, what, why didn't you get this done right? You failed at this project. We get told that all the time. And if we didn't, we usually have a negative view of ourselves anyway. Majority of us have a negative view of ourselves. I want you to hear today. Christ says you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be them. You don't have to be all these things you think other people's lives are that are so great. You just need to come to the point of surrender and to turn in this new direction. First Peter goes on to say, he himself bore our sins. He put it on himself in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness by his wounds, we have been healed. Because of him, we've been restored back into relationship with God. We can experience him fully. We can know him fully. This deliverance and freedom happens through repentance. So here's how I want, here's how I want to land the plane with you today. Friends, we are called to be people of repentance. We are called to be people of repentance. If Freedom and deliverance comes when we turn and when we repent. If you're going to live your best life through the corridor of walking through the road into, into repentance, then we've got to learn how to become people of repentance. Repentance is not a dirty word. I want to make repentance cool again. Repentance is a great word. Now, think about it. If you're the devil, okay, if you're the devil, and you know that breakthrough into freedom and deliverance happens through repentance. Wouldn't you try and make repentance the dirtiest, nastiest word you possibly could? You know that's how people break through in their lives. So you want it to be shame-filled. You want it to be guilt-filled. You want people, you want to play to people's ego and tell them, yeah, 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 you're, you got to be perfect. Don't admit your weakness. You want to play to all of that and make repentance into something nobody wants to touch. That's for everybody else. That's not for me. But here's what, if we're going to be people of repentance, we've got to understand a couple things. First, repentance is a daily practice. Repentance is a daily practice. Now, I understand that there will come a point in your life, and maybe it's today, where you come and you surrender your life to Jesus and you say, I turn, I have a change of mind, a change of heart. I want to move in a new direction. I want to do things God's way and not my own way. I hope that happens for you. That's the road to freedom. But I also understand that this is a daily journey for those of us who call ourselves Christ followers. Every one of us. Every one of us. Every day I wake up and I spend time in prayer. Or I've been traveling a bit, so it's a bit off, so I'll, I'll do this later in the day, right? But I tend to have a regular routine when I'm at home. And I spend time, and I go through the process of not just re-surrendering and stopping what I'm doing, but through repentance, turning and saying, Lord, realign my heart again today. 
God, I'm dealing with my anger. God, I'm dealing with my pride. God, I'm dealing with my lustful thoughts. God, I'm dealing with my jealousy. God, I'm surrendering all of it back to you today. And I say instead, fill me fresh with your Holy Spirit that I might move in the direction that you want me to go. It's a daily practice. James 2.20 reminds us, can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? There are a lot of people in the church that practice decisionism. They come into the church and they say, God, I, I want to be forgiven. And they walk out. They have a temporary change of mind, but then they go right back into that sinful nature. People of repentance are people who walk the daily journey out in the right direction. They don't allow themselves to be caught up in decisionism, but allow life transformation to really take place. And this, this is so important to understand that it's daily because it's also, repentance also has layers. Don't you see? Repentance has layers. You see, there are people in my life, maybe in yours, and this was my journey as well, and they'll say, God, I want to surrender to you. But we don't really know what that means when we're doing it, do we? We just know we want to give God our heart. And then six months later, we realize, oh my gosh, if I'm really going to give God my heart, that that's going to, that's going to dictate my speech. If I'm really going to give God my heart, that's going to dictate, hello, is that me? I'm sorry, I, I, I surrender. <laughs> I'm sorry. God, God if, if I'm really going to repent, if I'm really going to move in this new direction, then I, I'm going to have to give you my anger. I'm, I'm going to have to give you that area of my life. You know, my, my wife was in um, mental health counseling, right? She'd sit there as a counselor. And, and they would have these 50-minute sessions. And they'd sit there for 50 minutes. And in psychology and in counseling, they often talk about the 45-minute bomb. And here's what that looks like. You sit down and you go, how's everything going? And they go, oh, you know, everything's okay. You know, my marriage is good. And then they get to 45 minutes. They go, okay, we've got five minutes left. And then they go, I'm leaving my husband. <laughs> or they'd go, um, I I've just filed for bankruptcy. Or, uh, you know, I, 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 I can't keep a job. I've been unemployed for 12 years and I'm totally depressed. And they go, great, it's the 45-minute bomb. Even as a pastor when I'm having coffee with people right? I will talk for an hour, and then we get to that. Okay, I'm ready to go. Yeah, I'm leaving the church. Okay, okay, all right, great, great. So glad we talked. And, and what, what it really comes down to is that people on the inside know the thing that they need to deal with, but the guts and the courage that it takes to get it out, we don't want a, we don't want a response, is what they're saying. I just need to confess it. I don't actually want to change. I don't even want you to respond right now because I'm so shame-filled. If I were to say to you, what's the area in your life today that you need to repent from? Is it your business practices? Is it the way that you treat your spouse? Is it the way you treat your kids? Is it the way that you treat the church? Is it the way that you treat your finances? You see, repentance has layers. You can surrender your life to Jesus and find yourself immoral in one area of your life, and that too needs to come into submission to God. And I'm asking you not to wait 45 minutes to get it out on the table. You know what it is. I know what it is. And the scriptures already told us that on our own, we aren't good enough. We're going to do these things. It's in our nature to do it. Don't be surprised when other people deal with this stuff. I've been pastoring now, uh, I mean, this summer will be 27 years. And after 27 years, there's a whole lot of nothing that I haven't heard. You know what I'm saying? I've heard it all in the church. So you bring it, you know, the, the road to freedom and deliverance, to breaking curses in your life, is repentance. That's how you free yourself. You can do all the other things. You can cover it up. You can mask it up. You can build little castles on the side. You can do things to make yourself look a little bit better and deal with this. And people do that for decades. But you got to deal with it. You got to surrender it. You got to come to a point where you start walking in a new direction, believing that God has your best in mind and that he really can work through you through the power of, your, of his Holy Spirit. 
And remember this, remember this, that God will lead you into a place of freedom. At the end of the day, what a lot of people don't understand is that you've got to learn how to empty yourself. Far too often we walk into rooms like this and we know the things we've got to deal with and we don't want to deal with them because there's a lot of pain involved. And instead what we do is we walk in and we ask God to fill us. And honestly, God's looking back at us and going, you're already full of yourself, of your plans. Anybody else feel margined out in life? Anybody else feel like you're way too busy? Anybody else feel like your calendar's already full? Yeah, most of us. That's called modern culture, right? And you're so full of everything else that you're doing. You're like wrapped up and you're walking around like this on the inside. Just kind of going, I'm trying not to spew all over everybody else because I've got so much going on. And God goes, listen, if you want me to fill you up, you first got to go through the process of emptying yourself out. Empty yourself out of all of your agendas. Empty yourself out of all of your plans. Empty yourself out from the need to feel validated by others. Empty yourself out from whether or not I fit or not and all the insecurity that comes. Empty yourself out from the fear and the anxiety. Empty yourself out from the inappropriate relationships. Empty yourself out from the inappropriate business practices. Empty yourself out from all of it. Repent and believe the good news. Repent, turn, move, shake. Allow deliverance and freedom to come to you, the thing you really want. You know, in my church, I've been doing a series in Psalm 23. And Psalm 23 talks about the, the, the streams that he leads us beside the quiet waters. And there's this illustration that the, the shepherds would have to carve out the still waters because the, the, the rivers and the streams were rushing too fast that one shepherd who grew up in the Middle East said he would see the stream going so quickly and he'd see the sheep go up and they were really thirsty, but the water was moving so fast they got a little intimidated and they wouldn't drink. And then the shepherd comes along, sees the stream, and carves out the still water and meets them where they're at, and then they had the courage to drink. And I'm just so convinced that some of us, we see the river of God, we know what it takes, and there's a, there's a concern there that, that if we do this, we're going to be exposed. If we do this, that God's not going to really meet us. We're going to put ourselves out there, and God's not going to be on the other side. Because our memories are short, even though he's been there before. We're still afraid he won't be there in, in, in our current season. And I'm just so convinced that it is the kindness of God to carve out still streams for you today. To say to you, it's okay. Let go. Empty it out. Empty out everything. Empty out all your hopes and dreams and let me take control. God is not out to shame you. God is not out to guilt you. God is out to offer you the grace that you may not deserve, but that he freely gives to you.